it's time for our lamb's offering and uh, children's story. And Lindsay's going to give it this morning. We should appreciate that very much. Thank you, Betty. Good job, girls. Just the two of you, real small group today, huh? Um, so this is fun for me. I, I, I was really nervous, but it's fine. We all know each other. This, this is gonna be easy. <clears throat> you know why I was so nervous was because I didn't, like everybody else, what are you gonna talk about? Never done it before, first time for everything. So it feels good to try something new. But um, I was having a hard time coming up with something to talk about, so I finally asked Amina, you know, will you help me? And what should we talk about? She said, what story should we talk about? She said, um, well, you should talk about Jonah, Jonah and the whale. And I said, okay, and this was a week ago, you know, so I had a whole week to think on Jonah and the whale and I couldn't, I, I didn't know, how, you know, I wanted to pick one specific thing about the story that I could talk about. It wasn't coming up with anything. So last night I was thinking and thinking and thinking, Jonah, Jonah, and I realized after I asked God, please help me, this is, we're getting close to Sabbath morning, I need some help. I realized the whole time I'd been thinking about Jonah and the whale, I'd actually been thinking about a little boy that we know named Jonah, who lives in our neighborhood, and um, he, he, he and his sister used to be babysat at my house. They used to come after school and uh, while their parents were working. So Jonah is a wonderful little guy. He's, he's, I think he's in fourth grade now and I think he was in second grade when he was coming. And I remember that every time I think of Jonah, or every time I see Jonah, I always remember, I, start, I, I, feel, I feel a little bad because not long before Jonah stopped coming, his sister was old enough to watch them, um, I told him that I would find him a kid's Bible that he could take home and start to learn about Jesus. Because we talked about, you know, we talk about Jesus and God in our house, and he seemed really interested, and he also seemed a little sad that he didn't know about Jesus, because his parents didn't take him to church. And they're really nice parents. But for, you know, their, their reasons right now, they're not going to church. And he didn't know much about Jesus, so I told him I was going to find him a Bible. He said, yeah, that'd be great. Well, the school year got over pretty soon. I hadn't found one. Sure enough, pretty soon I found one when the summer started. And, uh, but I never gave it to him. He didn't have to come over anymore, and I never gave it to him, and I never gave it to him, and I never gave it to him. And so I've been meaning to do this for almost two years now, I think, probably exactly two years. And it makes me feel sad because I told somebody I was gonna do something and I didn't do it. And I don't know if you girls have ever done something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mina said, have you ever told somebody you were going to give them something and you never did? It's, it's a horrible feeling because you feel really guilty and everything. So I was thinking last night, wow, I'll tell our Jonah story and talk about how I'm pretty sure God still wants me to give him that Bible. I don't know if he's gotten a Bible. He might have, and I guess we wouldn't know unless we asked him. But see, he walks past my house every day after school, and school's starting up again. So I decided I'm going to <clears throat> get that Bible. I've had it the whole time. I'm going to say, Jonah, do you still want that Bible? And hopefully he'll say yes. I'm not going to be afraid whether he wants it or not or whether he remembers or anything like that. I'm just going to ask him, do you still want that Bible? Because he said before he did. So my point of my story is that 
pretty sure God still wants me to do something that just because I haven't done it yet, he still wants me to do it. And I think that I'll feel better after I do it. I think God will feel better after I do it. And I'm pretty sure Jonah will feel better after I do it, right? So, and maybe if he already has a Bible by now, he can give it to somebody else. But um, from now on, I decided if I ever see somebody that's almost a little bit interested in Jesus, that might not know Jesus and the love that Jesus can give, um, I'm going to ask them if they have a Bible, and I'm going to make sure I give it to them. That's on my life checklist from now on, so... Does that sound good? Does that sound something that you know we, you guys can do too? Because you talk to a lot of kids every day, so if you ever you know feel like maybe they're having a bad day, you could maybe you know let them know. Just say Jesus loves you, and then talk to your parents and figure out if you can give them a Bible. Maybe ask them if they have a Bible. Okay. Well, all of these days, you know, my mom hasn't given Jonah his Bible. Well, if if he already has a Bible, then and he gives and but he gave it to somebody, then he can have a kid's Bible that we want to give him it and. He might have a veil. That might be his best day. And we will have the best day ever. It feels good to give, doesn't it? Yeah. Good. Thank All you. Right. Thank you for listening. You can return back to your seats. We're glad to have Mrs. Thompson again sing the special music this morning.
Good morning and happy Sabbath Muscatine. Thank you, babes, for that song. Thanks to Calvary. Thanks to Calvary. I don't know, that's a point of rejoicing. Thanks to Calvary. No longer what we used to be. Praise the Lord. Thanks to Calvary. You know, earlier when I stood up to, for the opening hymn and saw David and Tamara, uh, my smile almost ended up here. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm so glad that they could join us again. And a special welcome to them, but also to, to all of the visitors here today at Muscatine. And thank you, as always, for the privilege of being here at Muscatine. And you would notice that this time, we parked over there. <laughs> so I accept that our visitor state status has gone away. <laughs> but you know, the story is told of a little boy by the name of Billy, and obviously he was misbehaving, so his mom sent him to his room. Say, now, you just take a time out and, and go and pray. So after a short time, he emerged from his room, and his mom was really pleased about that. And she said to him, Wow, great job. She also said, if you ask God to help you not to behave, he'll help you. Billy said, oh, but I didn't ask him to help me not to behave. I simply asked him to help you to put up with me. <laughs> So today, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> All right. Thank Dr. Swayze for the scripture reading, the scripture lesson. And I want to talk with you, taking a brief moment, talking with you about the new heart on the topic a new heart. How many of you would like a new heart? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you'd be so kind as to bow with me as we pray, I'd certainly appreciate that. Father in heaven, thank you for your love and the fellowship we enjoy. Thank you for the promises embedded in your word cause us to embrace your grace and the benefits related thereto by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Interestingly enough, talking about the heart, sometimes we think about the physical heart, don't we? Heart disease, according to the medical news today, on February 23rd, 2017, a well-known fact, heart disease is the number one cause of death 
in North America, and in fact, in the world. You'd have, you would have thought it to be something else, right? The number one cause of death, disease. In fact, it accounts for 25% of all deaths. 25%. It's primarily caused by a buildup of plaque in the arteries, narrowing the arteries and making blood flow a little bit more difficult. Obviously, when that happens, that buildup occurs, it results in a stroke or a heart attack. Some of the signs of synth or symptoms of heart disease, uh, chest pains, breathlessness, nausea, lightheadedness, cold sweats, pain and discomfort in the upper, upper body, arms, neck, jaw, and upper stomach. Of course, to avoid this attack, there are some precautions that we can take. Following the instructions of over-the-counter drugs, eating a diet that is low in salt, refined sugars, and total fat, or even saturated fat, or cholesterol, and a diet that is high in fruits, fresh fruits, and vegetables. Avoid alcohol. Quit smoking. Take steps to reduce stress levels. Or get help with stress management. So we see that there's an issue, but there are also solutions. When one suffers heart disease, more often than not, it gets to the point where if so far gone, there's hardly anything that can be done. Except, of course, that in many cases over the years, you would have heard about any number of heart transplants. A transplant procedure might be required, and I'm research, my research seems to suggest that there are quite an abundance of them that are done on an annual basis. Of course, the first step is that of harvesting a heart from a possible donor. And that's not always so easy. It's not as if you can go in the store and buy a heart. The second step in the operation is removing the recipient's damaged heart, taking it out completely. And the third is that of the implantation of the donor heart into the patient. The physical heart is not the only heart issue that human beings have. This is why today we are talking about a new heart. The spiritual heart, human heart, is also sick. And the source of this infection, we will discover, but with respect to the spiritual heart. Of course, Peter, in 1 Peter 3 and 4, describes the heart more often, of course. It is referenced to as the mind, the mental, emotional, 
and will. Peter notes it to be the hidden man of the heart, the inner self, the human heart. Proverbs 4 and 23 tells us that it is the center of one's being. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. The heart is where we believe and exercise faith. Luke 24 and 25. It is the location of the human deliberation where wisdom is employed. In the spiritual context, God wants us to have a good heart. The source of infection in the human heart, what do you think that might be? The source of infection in the human heart, in the spiritual context, is sin. Sin. David in Psalms 51 and 5 makes the point, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Romans 3 and 23 makes it clear that none has or will escape the spiritual heart disease. For all have sinned and come short, fall short of the glory of God. David's plea for a new heart in Psalms 51, 9 and 10, he says, hide your face from my sins, pleading to God and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Jesus is still the answer to our heart disease. Romans 5 and 15 tells us that this remedy, obviously then if we have heart issues spiritually, the remedy then has to be clearly a heart transplant or heart transformation. There's only one who can do that procedure, <laughs> and that's Jesus. Romans 5 and 15 says, but the free gift is not like the transgression, for it is by the transgression of the one the many died. Much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. <laughs> Inasmuch as sin has caused there to be a hard problem in humankind, Jesus has come to eradicate it. How does this transplant occur? Well, he's given us a solution in Ephesians 2 and 8, merely for us to accept his free grace by faith. Not of ourselves, but it is indeed a gift, the gift of God 
not as a result of works, so that anyone might boast? Do you need a heart transplant? A new heart he wants to give us. How do we get this new heart? Romans 10, 9 and 10 gives us the solution, says confess and believe. That's the solution to the sin problem, that of if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. A new heart he wants to give us. That heart transplant surgery in the spiritual context occurs by coming to the cross daily. It's not new. Come to the cross daily. Invite the mind and character of Christ Jesus in you. Invite the mind and character of Christ Jesus. Receive his thoughts, feelings, and motives. Romans 12 and 2 is clear on that point. Then want us to be conformed. Then allow him, Jesus, to live out his life in and through us and to use us to bring honor and glory to him. Jesus is thereby achieving his purpose in and through us in that transformed state. A new heart he has promised us. In Ezekiel 36, 26, from our scripture reading, a new heart, it says, is accompanied by the spirit of Jesus Christ. Moreover, and this was God's promise to rebellious Israel at the time, because you remember that scenario, God then sought to remedy Israel's sin problem. That was Israel of old. Does spiritual Israel today have a sin problem? Spiritual Israel then also has a heart disease and has a need for a new heart. He says, moreover, I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That was God's promise, and that is indeed today his promise. The characteristics of this new heart, obviously, because the new heart comes with a new spirit, how then can we identify the qualities of this new heart embedded in the new spirit? God's spirit, according to Genesis, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, God's spirit 
reflects a very pregnant fruit. With his active presence. Well, you may be like, well, well, where did that come from? Well, let's have a look. It says the fruit. Now, if God's spirit is in us, that spirit should reflect his characteristics. The fruit of the spirit is what? But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How do we identify the spirit? Love. This is not love with expectation or qualification. It's not, we're not talking about the warm, fuzzy feeling. We're talking about a deliberate attitude of goodwill and devotion to others. Love gives freely without looking at whether the other person deserves it or not. We're talking about the love of Christ. It's given without expecting anything in return. The characteristic of this spirit, the spirit of Jesus, is joy. Joy in the Lord, completely independent of the good or bad things that happen in the cause of a day. Can we find joy in the middle of the storm? Yes, with a new heart, we can. It's a supernatural gladness given by God's Spirit that actually seems to show up best during hard times. Peace, not the absence of turmoil, but the presence of tranquility, even while in a place of chaos. It is a sense of wholeness and completeness Content knowing that God is in control. Patience. These are all of the characteristics of that very pregnant spirit. The fruit called the spirit of Jesus possesses these characteristics. Described patience as lenience, long-suffering, forbearance, perseverance, and steadfastness. It is the ability to endure ill treatment from life or at the hands of others without lashing out or seeking revenge. Kindness completely devoid of selfishness, adapting to meet the needs of others, moral goodness. It's also the absence of malice. Goodness, reflective of the character of God, a desire to see goodness in others, not beyond confronting or even abuking, rebuking by the way, but of course, to be able to see the goodness in others. Faithfulness. A faithful person is one with real integrity. Someone others can look to as an example. One who is truly devoted to others and to Christ Jesus. Spirit-controlled faithfulness is evident in the life of a person who seeks good for others and glory 
for God. Gentleness, meekness is not weakness. Did I say that right? Meekness is not weakness. Choosing to defer to others without being brash or headstrong. It forgives others, corrects with kindness, and lives in tranquility. Self-control is literally releasing our grip on fleshly desires. Choosing to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, it is power focused in the right place. The new heart that Jesus wants to give his people is completely reflective of his spirit. The spirit that he has promised to put in us. And that spirit always being perfectly reflective of the fruit which possesses these nine characteristics. You see, the relationship between a new heart and the Christian and humankind generally is so important that it is tightly knitted to our life eternal. A new heart equals life eternal. Second Corinthians 5 and 17 tells us, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. Jeremiah 24 and 7, I will give them a heart to know me. For I am the Lord, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. For they will return to me with their whole heart. God wants us to be committed to him with our whole heart. Ezekiel 11 and 19, very consistent with Ezekiel 36 and 26 from our scripture. And I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. And I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36 and 26 just backs that up with moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, a new heart. My brothers and sisters in Christ, that old heart that doesn't work anymore, that old heart that's plagued by sin, Jesus wants us to have a new heart, both physically and spiritually. Amen? Yes, indeed. The human heart was created to mirror God's own heart. How can we be so sure about this? Well, Genesis 1 and 27 tells us what? God created man, how? In his own image, right? In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So God created us 
in such a way that his expectation, even then and now, is that we would be reflective of his image. We are designed to love him, to love righteousness, and walk in harmony with God and with others. Malachi 6 and 8. God desires for us to love and to serve him. When we stubbornly, did I say stubbornly? <laughs> when we stubbornly refuse to follow God, our hearts which were designed to communicate with him are hardened. And God compares rebellious hearts to stone. That's what he calls it. Zechariah 7 and 12. A heart of stone. A heart of stone finds it impossible to repent. Finds it impossible to love God or to please him. The hearts of sinful humanity are so hardened that we cannot even seek God on our own. And that's why Jesus said, no one, nobody can come to him unless the Father first draws him. He's doing the drawing. John 6 and 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. I often marvel when I hear people talking about in one form or the other how possible it is for them to work for their salvation. Have you ever heard that kind of commentary? <laughs> oh, but the Bible says, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Well, if you can work out your own salvation, I strongly suggest to you that you go ahead and work out your salvation and then let me know how you did it. <laughs> we can't work out our salvation. Jesus gives us the clear remedy. It is he who wills and does in us of his good pleasure. See that work out your own salvation, that's only the first part of the text. How about the rest? It is he who wills and does his good pleasure. A heart of stone finds it impossible to repent. Or love the Lord, we said. We desperately need a new heart. For we are unable to soften our own hearts. A change of heart toward God requires a supernatural transformation. Not anything I can do. But a supernatural transformation. Who alone can cause that supernatural transformation to occur? Jesus. You will recall only too well in John 3 and 3 the story, the first part of John 1 to 15, the story uh, with whom? John 3, 1 to 15 talks about whom? Nicodemus. Right? What did Jesus say to him about this heart transformation? You must be born again. You must be born again. And only he can do that. Only Jesus can cause that second birth to occur so that we might be qualified to enter into his kingdom and to see God. When we are born again, God causes that heart transplant and heart transformation to occur. 
In fact, 1 John 1 and 8 tells us that he gives us a new heart. The power of the Holy Spirit changes our hearts from sin-focused to God-focused. Now, when that happens, is it then that we are perfect, never to sin again? Well, what does the scripture have to say about that? If we say we have no sin, see, it's a work in progress, isn't it? If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No, we don't have any perfection of ourselves. But we do have the righteousness of who? Of Jesus. He's declared us so to be. He justifies us. The process of justification. Well, how soon does justification occur? When we come to him in confession. And when we surrender completely to him. How long does that take? Justification. Well, justification happens right away, doesn't it? Now, sanctification is the life, is the work of a lifetime, isn't it? Every day, more and more, he continues to perfect us as we look toward his soon coming, receiving him as our savior gives us access to God and his power, the power to transform our hearts from sin hardened to Christ softened. And Romans 6 and 10 tells us, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives in God. Even so, I love this part, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Consider yourself to be dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. That's what the new heart effect is all about. With new hearts, we are reconciled to Christ. We are ambassadors of Christ and declared righteous before God. How can we be sure? Does that sound about right? Well, let's not go on what it sounds. What does the Bible tell us? How about that? Right? We live a simple life. The Bible says it. We believe it, and that settles it. Are we agreed? Second Corinthians 5 and 21 is very clear on this point. It says, now all these things are from God. Reading from verse 18. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Reconciled. Verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be 
reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin. And who's that? Jesus. To be sin on our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. A new heart gives us that privilege. Just as God promised Israel of old in their condition to do all of the things that he said he would in our scripture reading. In Ezekiel 22 to 30. In fact, the whole bit of it gives us even more. He made some great promises to them. But just as he did to them, those promises are still good today for spiritual Israel. Moreover, moreover, I will give you a new heart. That new heart is still available to you and I today. I will put along with this new heart a new spirit in you. And I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you then a heart of flesh. Not only that, but verse 27 tells us what happens next. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Do you get the flow there? First, I'll give you the new heart. Then I'll put my spirit in. But I'm not going to leave you alone there and say to you, now you go ahead and walk in my statues, observe my law, and observe my ordinances. Who's doing the doing here? Well, let me read it again, just to be clear, because I might have read it wrong, right? Let's just read it again, verse 27. Let's see who's doing the doing, all right? I, God, will put my spirit within you. Who was responsible for putting the spirit? God. And cause. Well, when you cause something to happen, well, I can cause this book to be arisen, right? Who's doing the causing? He is. And will cause you to walk in my statues. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. It is he then in us, the new heart of Christ Jesus in us, and the new spirit that he gives us, that causes us to walk in his statutes, that causes us to keep his law, that causes us to be faithful, that causes us to keep his commandments, that causes us to reflect the characteristics of that very pregnant fruit, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace. It is he having given us a new heart and put in us a new spirit that causes it to be so. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, would you like a new heart? Amen. Praise the Lord. A new heart is available to all. Let's embrace it. If you accept today the brokenness
and the fragility of your heart, I appeal to you, if you accept the brokenness and fragility of your heart, and if you have a desire for both a new physical heart and a new spiritual heart, because we will have a new physical heart, won't we? But why are you guessing about that? I fully expect that we'll all be in heaven, right? I make the assumption that we will all be a part of which resurrection? Amen. The first, right? So in that case, we will have a new heart. I expect that all of us will be there, if indeed it is, that we are committed to surrendering completely to Jesus, the great physician, and walking in his statues. If that is your prayer, if that is your desire, I invite you to stand with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promises of your word. We thank you even now for the benefit of a new heart. We thank you for not just giving us a new heart, but planting in us your spirit. We beg of you, O oh Lord, to keep us in a surrendered state, accepting the full benefits of your grace by faith so that we might live our salvation even now as we look forward to your soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Eddie Cabrera from the Muscatine Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you're looking for Christian education, contact us. Something is really happening right now, and we're thinking about reopening our church school. So contact me. My number is 417-840-2806. God bless you.